Good evening. My name is Dennis Murashko. I'm the president of the chapter of the Federalist Society here at Northwestern. And on behalf of our law school and the Federalist Society organization, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2007 Student Symposium on Law and Morality. You'll hear a lot of good discussion, a lot of good debates and panels today and tomorrow, and I would just encourage you all to take some of that away with you and discuss it with each other, ask questions. This is what it's, it's all about, after all. We'll also have Judge Pryor coming in tomorrow for the keynote address, which we're all excited about. So I'm, I'm confident that there's something here for everybody. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to note the special significance of this year when the Federal Society is celebrating the 25th anniversary, which is quite a remarkable achievement. And I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit today, but you all know what debate is, means to us as law students, and to have that on our campuses is just phenomenal. Now, that's, that wasn't always the case, and 25 years ago, the sentiment was not necessarily shared on many law school campuses. And three students wanted to do something about it, one of them at Yale, two at University of Chicago. And they decided to put together the first symposium, which started this great tradition which has gone on strong for the past 25 years and will be, I'm sure, going on strong for the next 25 years. And that's something we should all be thankful for. And with that said, let me just say how honored I am to introduce to you one of those three students who in the last 25 years has grown up to be a phenomenal professor here at Northwestern and who has, for me at least, served as one of the foundational pillars of my education here, Professor Stephen Calabresi. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome the many members of the Federalist Society to Northwestern University School of Law, which has been my home for the last 17 years now. Northwestern Law School shares with the Federalist Society a belief in the value of vigorous and full debate, and I'm happy to say that we are one of the two most intellectually diverse of the top 25 American law schools. Our constitutional law faculty boasts social conservatives like Stephen Presser, pragmatic liberals like former Dean Robert Bennett, libertarian conservatives like John McGinnis, eminent social scientists like Lee Epstein and Tonya Jacoby, and ardent liberal textualists like Marty Reddish. Like the Federalist Society, Northwestern Law School lives by the motto, we care not what you think, only that you think because if you think, you'll eventually come around to our point of view. <laughs> in addition to promoting debate, however, the Federalist Society is also committed in its mission statement to the restoration of the rule of law and to the idea that the state exists to protect freedom. The Society describes its purpose as being to reorder the legal system, to place a premium on individual liberty, traditional values, and the rule of law. It's highly appropriate, therefore, that the subject for this weekend's conference is to explore the relationship between law and morality. This conference is premised on the notion that there is and ought to be some connection between law and morality, and that it is possible to achieve something called the rule of law. I hope that our discussion here causes all of us to think harder about law's autonomy as a separate and independent discipline from the social sciences. The rule of law tradition is deeply rooted in the West and dates back to the times of ancient Rome. One of the things that characterizes the Western legal traditions is a commitment to the idea that there is and ought to be a sharp separation between law, morality, and religion. We think law is influenced by but is distinguishable from religion and morality. Our judges are not priests and our courts are not ecclesiastical bodies. We have a separate core of people who study and train to be lawyers from those who study and train to be priests. We think the law is independent of not only church officials, but also of government, and that it's a body of rules that grows and changes over time. It's precisely because law is not divinely inspired in the West that we believe it can change and develop over time rather than being frozen in the ninth century. We think the historicity of the law is linked to its supremacy over religious and governmental institutions. 
There are other important legal traditions in the world, both historically and today, that have denied the idea that there is and ought to be a separation between law and religion. Many fundamentalist Muslims disagree with the Western idea that law and religion ought to be separated. Some Western Europeans and many Americans wonder if we in the West have gone too far in separating law and morality. Western law has its roots in the Judeo-Christian religious traditions, but for 2,000 years now, it's evolved in its own distinct directions. The very Western separation of law and religion may itself have religious underpinnings. One of the cardinal teachings of the New Testament, after all, is that we ought all to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. The question of whether one can su successfully legislate morality depends, in my opinion, on one's ideas about human nature. If one believes that human beings are inherently good, as Rousseau and Karl Marx believed, then all that is necessary is to free them from the shackles of law and from centuries of conditioning in a world of private property, and then utopia will follow. They, Rousseau and Marx taught that man is a noble savage and uh, that all that is required to perfect him is to cast off property and tradition and give a leading role in government to those who are committed utopians. James Madison and the framers of the American Constitution were much more uh, cautious about human nature. Madison wrote in the 10th Federalist paper that the latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, government, and many other points, an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power, or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions, have in turn divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosities, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for the common good. Madison says that human nature is sufficiently f fallen that it's impossible to eliminate the causes of faction. All that law can accomplish, in Madison's opinion, is to regulate its effects. This is done by constructing a government in which ambition is made to counteract ambition. Madison says it's a reflection on human nature that such devices are necessary to control the abuses of government, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this you must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place oblige it to control itself. I think history has clearly shown that Madison was right about human nature and Rousseau and Marx were tragically wrong. Human beings are not inherently good, nor are they plastic and malleable. Efforts to alter human nature by squeezing round pegs into square holes leave a lot of dead and severely injured human beings. The problem with government efforts to enforce morality is that power corrupts and government leaders are fallen men and women. I think it's appropriate, therefore, to be very cautious and modest about supporting governmental efforts to legislate morality. I do not think, however, that morality ought to be driven out of the law. All of our legal rules, including laws against murder, assault, and robbery, have religious and moral underpinnings. Applied cautiously in the way they have been applied for centuries, those religiously inspired laws can nudge men and women into behaving better and being better human beings than they, than they otherwise would be. Law can be used modestly to nudge us uh, in the direction of the good. Thus, I support laws, for example, against mutually consensual dueling or prostitution or assisted suicide or private racial discrimination. At a minimum, we can ask the government not legislate immorality, as it does when it spends taxpayer dollars encouraging people to engage in self-destructive behavior like gambling through the medium of buying state lottery tickets. Law and morality are inevitably intertwined, and this is a good thing, so long as we realize that man cannot be perfected on Earth, that utopia in this world is unattainable, and that at some fundamental level, we must all render unto Caesar only the things that are Caesar's, while rendering unto God the things that are God's. Thank you.